Well, it has been a day. We got here this morning at 7 o'clock. God was already here. I mean, he had already arrived. There was no effort to get into that prayer meeting. He met you at the door. I believe it will be so in the morning. I hope that you'll join us here in this house in the morning. I learned a long time ago when I first, I knew this when I got saved. But the devil's crowd, they stay up all night. They drink, they get drunk, they stay up all night. So if you get up early, you'll beat him. Oh, yeah, it's a whole lot easier to find God. He's, he's got a hangover. He's, he's, he, he doesn't get up early at all because he's had a bad night. And if you get up early, I dream God said, If they that seek me early will be found of me. Amen. If you just seek him early. Put him first. Talk to God before you talk to your wife or your husband. Read the Bible before you read any other thing. Just read God before you get to the newspaper. You know, I don't know. This, this is the fifth year we've been coming. How many years have we been here? Seventh year. Seventh year. I, I just thinking today, I was telling the pastor... There's a lot of mega churches, so-called, have a lot of people. Spend a lot of money for comforts and a lot of money for a lot of things. But in the seven years that we've been coming here, I, I'd just like to take a minute here to tell you. The first year uh, that we came here, we came Bolivia. We're just moving to Bolivia. Brother Darrell Turner had been uh, made it possible for us to go down there. And seven years ago, we took the school to Bolivia. Today, 1,200 students later, and 200 churches at least across that world come out of that. You know, out of that. The seed come from here. You paid for us going there, for the opening of that school, and for about the first year of the school, not just one school, but school after school come out of that. And today in Bolivia... There, there is. I was down there about 18 months ago and had over 200, 200 of those students in a time of fast and prayer for three days. And oh my, my, the testimonies all the way up. Sister Esther had had to ride a donkey back up in there. Some of those students come down where nobody had ever been. And for her to go up there to plant those churches, she had to ride a donkey. Can't ride a horse. You run into snakes. Horses will jump off a cliff. Donkey won't. He doesn't pay attention. Mules and donkeys don't pay attention to snakes. That's the reason they ride them in mountains. But from there, we went to Argentina, I believe, the next year. One of the finest young families America can afford operates that down there. They come out of Louisiana. They've been down there. Unbelievable what's come out of that venture in two. The next year you sponsored us, amen, in, in, into Peru. We, we went down there, you paid for that 408 students. This, this paid for that entire thing. 408 students, all the superintendents, the presbyters, we had the Assemblies of God, they were, everybody was invited, but the Assemblies of God gave us in Lima, Peru, their whole uh, 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 place, compound. We went in there, and 400 nights, your pastor came and preached that last night. You could heard him all the way downtown Lima. as that man of God come down the line on that Holy Ghost. But out of that, he told about that little uh, superintendent that came, come through the school there. Just a, He wasn't hardly as tall as this pulpit. But he come up to have, every night they had soup or something for us. And he was up there and he told me, he said, for $1,000, I can get people to build a church there. No churches, nowhere. He was invading the world on that Amazon. He said, you only know about the Amazon. There are a lot of rivers down there. He said, Pastor Clinton, you can go. He said, there, there, are, there are mosquitoes down there. It's bigger than house flies. And he said, there's things down there. be impossible for you to go down there and live, but I can go. And he said, there's nobody been along those rivers, but I can go. 
and he said, these students coming out of uh, Quito, not uh, El Quito, E Quito, I believe it is. One's Quito up in, uh, in the other world, Ecuador, but E Quito. But he said, along that river, he said, $1,000, I can get people come down and build it. But he said, if I had a steel saw, that's at S-T-H-E-I-L, you know. He said, I, I could build it for $100. He said, we live uh, down there in the rainforest and plenty of timber. Got all the timber we need, cost nothing. Well, I made a call that night to my pastor, took the church where I was, and I said, you know, if we had two steel saws, we, we could do it. Now, you understand, you paid for all this right here. For us to be there, all of that to happen, amen, come out of this convention. Well, he sent me $2,600 for those two saws because you have to pay 100% taxes on it. Well, the last report, 43 church buildings had been built. I've been wanting to write to the steel company and tell them what those saws to see if he couldn't donate a couple more. <laughs> Amen. After all of that. From there, you sent us to Jordan. Seven. You paid for that entire school. Here that year, it cost me to get there to bring them out of Egypt, 28 students. We paid their round trip ticket around 40 something thousand dollars to bring them into Jordan. I stayed there the entire time. We taught them. We taught them this school. There were seven Arabic nations represented there. In Egypt, unbelievable. I'm going back there in February. They say, you have to come back now because the whole Arabic world is demoralized. They're saying, where was Allah when we come into Iraq? When 200,000 men defeated a million-man army, where was Allah? The time is right. But you sponsored us there. In there, four men from Iraq. We sent them back with the school of Christ. They all began the school. We never had any report for uh, uh, out of the other three, but the one, Jules, is, is there in Baghdad. You saw him, met him. You come a product of what you did. He had 63 students in that school in Baghdad in 2001. I don't know what he had when the when the shock and awe began in Baghdad. Uh, just a few months ago, but I do know right now that every house of every student has become a church and 50 people, he's got 150 in his own house, jammed in that house. They're being filled with the Holy Ghost, being born again. I'm talking about Muslims now. I'm not talking about uh, people in Florida. Muslims, they're being born. He said a stream has broke out in that desert. I was able to preach to the secret police. They confiscated everything, including the school of Christ. And he said they watched that school of Christ, very suspicious of Brother Clendenin because he was a Marine. They thought we we're going to bring another troop of them over there, I guess. But all of that come out of here. Now in India, you know, there were 80 students. I never can remember. Do you know, uh, I can't, that was some long name. Uh, 80 preachers that wanted to go through this school that was impossible for us to go up there, just could not go. The, the condition of things made it impossible for us to go there. Just some places we can't go, but there's no place this school can't go. But our man Josh said, all of them, we can bring them out, train them, and send them back. Well, we brought now, I, I, I don't know how many at this point we brought out, but you paid for all of them to come out. And now they said, the ones that come out said, what we've got to do is take this school back. And so they said, it, and the money that you gave pays for that school going on now in a world in India nobody had ever been uh, like us to train them. A few were up there. There were 80 men up there. But all of that, I just wanted to tell you, has come out of this. You have not given in vain. Amen. There's been a, there has been a harvest reap that it will take eternity. I'll tell you, they'll be up there shaking your hand, thanking you in eternity that you sent somebody there to tell them about this gospel. I just wanted to give you that report tonight. I just thought it was so important. You know, we labor 
We don't see you sometime. A lot of things happening around us. We live in a world that's got more interested in things than they have God. But yet out there, the harvest is going on. In Bolivia, every day, they're mutating. Those churches are mutating, and God writes up a little bit more. Amen to your account because you were faithful in seeing that this school got there. Amen. I want you to turn with me tonight. I'm going to read... First of all, in the book of Matthew, chapter 28, verses 18 and 20. Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go you therefore and teach all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you even to the ends of the earth. I want you to go with me to Deuteronomy chapter 28. Deuteronomy chapter 28. I want to read to you verses 1 and 2 and verse 15 of Deuteronomy chapter 28. Verses 1 and 2, then skip down to verse 15. And it shall come to pass, if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe and to do all his commandments which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all the nations of the earth. And all these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee if thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. Down to verse 15 we read, And it shall come to pass if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe and to do all his commandments and his statutes which I command thee this day, that all these curses shall come on thee and overtake thee. That's the word of God. Now, I want you to turn with me to the, to the book of Ezekiel. In that wonderful prophet of God, I, I, I want to, in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 33, amen. Book of Ezekiel, chapter 33, and I, I want to read the first six verses. Amen. Chapter 33 of this great book of Ezekiel. That's on page 622. Amen. Amen. Chapter 33, verses 1 through 6. Again, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, speak to the children of thy people, say unto them, when I bring the sword upon a land, if the people of the land take a man of their people of the land, take a, take a man of their coast and set him for their watchman. And if when he see if the sword come upon the land, he blow the trumpet and warn the people, then whosoever heareth the sound of the trumpet, take it not warning. If the sword come and take him away, his blood shall be upon his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet, took not warning. His blood shall be upon him, but he that taketh warning shall deliver his soul. But if the watchman see the sword come, and blow not the trumpet, and the people be not warned, if the sword come, and take any person among them, he is taken away in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at the watchman's hand. Father, thank you that you'll help us tonight to bring the Word of God. You speak to us through the Word tonight. Let us hear what you're saying. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. I set before you, God said, a blessing and a curse. God said that to all of us in this house tonight. 
says it to his church everywhere. I set before you a blessing and a curse. Now, I, I want to speak to not, not about God, but I want to speak for God. And if you have any question about what I've got to say, then take it up with him. Because I, I come here not to talk about him, but to talk for him. There's blood on the hands of the 21st century Pentecostal church. There's blood on those hands tonight. And it's the blood of the unreached perishing millions that are out there around this room, represented a lot of countries of the world. That little girl up there with the bananas on her head has haunted me ever since I got here on a Monday. I wonder where she is tonight. Did anybody ever tell her, this beautiful little African girl, did anybody ever get to her from the time that picture was taken? Has somebody cared enough to tell her? There's been a haunting thing. Two thousand years ago, the Lord Jesus Christ gave the assignment. I read it to you tonight. He gave the assignment that we was to disciple all nations. You know, I never realized how biblical we really were with this school of Christ until this last convention when our man who's over all of the Philippines and up through Indonesia, our superintendent, one well, of the major uh, attorneys of Louisiana, left that and become a superintendent of the School of Christ after he went through this school in California. But he, in his testimony, read from the 19th chapter of Acts, verses 9 and 10, how that the Apostle Paul was in Asia. And when, the, when he said, when the multitude hardened their hearts, then he separated those disciples in the school of one Tyrannus, and he said he, he separated them and disputed with them, which it meant he taught them. And in two years, all of Asia heard the word of God. By taking, discipling, and sending, all of Asia heard the word of God. Now, God gave us this assignment. But today, 2,000 years later, there are over 2 billion people on this planet that have never the first time heard the word of Jesus, the name of Jesus one time. I've heard that name over a hundred times this day. I prayed that name probably a hundred times, and yet 2 billion people live on this planet that have never heard it the first time. We have I've been charged to tell them, but we've spent that money in the wrong direction. These perishing billions of unreached people are seldom mentioned or thought about in the average church. Maybe once a month we'll have a missions. Maybe once a month they may be mentioned, but they're hardly ever thought of in the average church of our time. There's a little prayer for missions, and I read where only one penny out of every 100 evangelical dollars goes to the reaching of the lost and the damned of this earth. Think about it. Only one penny. Yet 50,000 perish every day without Christ. They go into a Christless grave every day from the time we dismissed last night until this time tonight. 50,000 people have dropped into eternity without God and yet a church sleeps it good at night when they're responsible that they never heard the name of Christ. How God must weep over this incredible apathy of a people that know God. The Holy Spirit's deal with our heart. He talks to us. We declare our sorrow for neglecting the perishing millions of this earth. We sometimes enter in to a solemn covenant with God to reach the 
people wherever they are or whatever the cost in those times we'll commit ourselves to develop a simple lifestyle and sacrifice that those millions may hear the gospel but months and years later it's the same thing all of the money being poured into ourselves we haven't sacrificed at all we haven't changed our lifestyle unless we've raised it a little bit has been the only change that's been made in this age of broad-mindedness you hear that word and that terminology a lot it's a light thing for the church and the individual to disregard a covenant with the Almighty God it's nothing we can talk about the Ananias and Sapphira that fell dead at an altar for lying to God but how many in this room have stood at an altar of God and made a commitment to God and in three weeks it was over with they never lived up to what they said they said to God I'm going to pray more for the lost I'm going to give more for the lost but in a little while all of that has been forgotten the church for the most part does not teach nor understand the fear of God they do not teach now not everyone is guilty there are those who do diligently work and sacrifice to reach the unreached. I had one pastor, he, he gets annoyed when you really talk about missions, it gets on to him. And he said, a man come through here, and he was on the way to airport to some, uh, going to some country somewhere to be a missionary, to preach the gospel. And said, I said to him, how about the 200,000 people that live between here and the airport? I said, I'll tell you what about them. Every one of them got seven Bibles in their home. There's a church screamed from television and radio. There's everything I'm talking about. That little girl don't have a Bible. There's nobody to tell her about Jesus. That Indian man over there has a billion gods. Three billion, in fact. He knows nothing about this Christ. That's the difference between your next door neighbor and the people out there that know nothing about God. Amen. Man, not everyone is guilty, but for the most part, the church is only tribal with the command to disciple the nations. When confronted with their rebellion, amen, in this matter of disciple of the nations, they'll say what harm has been done. But God Almighty would answer that question with the same question. What harm has been done? Yes, sir, I believe with the same question. Don't we know that among the unreached multitudes of multiplied thousands die every day? You know, I've learned along this walk with God that if I wake up in the night, 3, 4, 2 o'clock in the morning, and there's nobody breaking in, there's no pain, I don't have to go anywhere, that God woke me up and wants to talk. I just listen at that moment in that quietness. Here's some few years ago, I woke up around 2 o'clock in the morning, and it was one of those times, and I live there quietly, and I heard him say to me, how many? many people do you think are in hell because you haven't prayed like you ought to pray? When Zion travails, they'll be born. If Zion don't travail, the people that would be born went to hell. How many do you think because a lazy church can't get up and pray that they've gone to hell by the multitudes because we won't sacrifice a little of our time to stand in that gap and make up the hedge for 2,000 million people that never heard the name of the Lord Jesus? Precious eternal souls, brutally massacred by by Satan's forces with none to deliver them. The Bible says in the book of Romans that the Holy Spirit would make intercession through us for saints of God to minister life and deliverance. Multitudes died today in Sudan, in Indonesia, simply because they believe what we believe. Yet we come in our little air-conditioned churches and put up a little entertainment. We come and go and never feel the pressure 
number of those precious ones that never heard about him. God said to me, while my complacent sons and daughters waste their time watching television, millions fall into a hell forever. While they waste their time entertained by people that mock the family, most of the people that produce it are homosexuals, entertained by that trash, multiplied millions drop off of the preface into a night where there's no return. Oh, that God would stir us tonight. What harm has been done. Millions each year among the unreached are dragged to eternal darkness while a selfish church listen to stern choirs, church performances in their fine air-conditioned buildings. Nothing wrong with having an air-conditioned building. Nothing wrong with driving a good car. But you ought to spend equal amount to know that a world can hear about Christ. If I'm not willing to sacrifice at least equally that church that won't give it'll spend five million dollars on a beautiful edifice but won't give a hundred thousand a year to see men turn from the darkness into light what is the church here for to entertain tares or to reach a world for God we got to make up our mind what side that we're on in this struggle for God God takes no pleasure in much of the activities, amen, because the screams of the helpless perishing drowned out the sign of our merrymaking, amen. God hears nothing. In the last 15 years, 250 million souls have been mercilessly butchered by the adversary, and the blood is dripping from our hands. I said the blood is dripping. The stolen resources was going to be accounted to one day. One day we're going to face Almighty God and He's going to say to you, Pastor Hal, well done, or why? There'll be no in-between. Why? If we've reached out to that lost and damned world, He's going to say well done. If not, He's going to say why? He never commanded us to do what we could not do. We can reach a world for God. You can hear the response of the modern Laodicean church, but surely we're not responsible. God's answer is He has given us the church 100 times the money needed to evangelize this world. We spent it on jet airplanes. One of the superstars of religion on my television said to uh, the audience, listen, my wife gets angry at me. She said, Daddy, they can't hear you. I preach back at him sometime. He screamed out at me, my faith got me a jet airplane. What is your faith got you? I screamed back. I said, my faith delivered me from the vanity of wanting one while millions perish without God. Oh, my God, if we could hear the cry of the Holy Spirit tonight. I said, if we could hear that cry, amen. God's answer, He, God, has given a hundred times the money to complete. He's given a hundred times the young people the church needs for personnel. He's given all the leisure time we would need for prayer. Plus, unbelievable technology has been given to the modern-day church. You can hear the Holy Spirit whisper, the job can be done if you just ache for it to be done like I do. If you your heart fell for it like mine. It can be done. In 10 years, this school is in 120 countries of the world. Tens of thousands we've discipled in those nations. Thousands of churches have been planted. Amen. We can reach this generation. But instead, the church for the most part has robbed God and used those resources for our own selfishness has used them for her own selfishness amen listen 
I believe God is saying, unless repentance comes quickly to this church, that is, unless you and I turn from our own self-will and begin to fulfill the purpose for which we've been called, we're going to experience God's displeasure in every part of our lives. Amen. You can mark her down. God never forgets anything. I said the other night, David had been king a long time time when drought hit Israel. It continued. He knew it was judgment and he knelt down and he said, oh God, why? And he said, it's because of what Saul done to those I made a covenant with. God never forgets. It was 20 long years or 13 long years rather before those elder brothers faced Joseph. They thought it's all forgotten, but it wasn't forgotten. Let me tell you, God God forgets nothing. He writes on that wall, mister, whether we did or we didn't, make no mistake about it, we will face him. Amen. Because we used the money that he gave us for our own comfort and desire, God is getting ready to plunge us into financial distress that we never dreamed of. Because, listen, every true economist in this country will tell you he does not understand why financial doomsday has not already arrived. Taxes and inflation are the curse of God. You hear me? I said they're the curse of God. The only reason it hasn't come, God has given the church a place to repent. Everywhere men talk of conspiracy. Amen. I can tell you conspiracy is only a tool of God. He can hold it or withhold it. He can let it go or stop it. It's what his church does that's going to determine what comes upon this land and this place. Amen. Like Israel, we stand between the mountains of blessing and curse, and we will choose, you and I are going to choose which one. It's going to be on our house. I can't do anything about everybody collectively, but I can do what I can about me. Amen. I can. I have all. The second thing concerning God's displeasure was because we used our health and our strength to do our will instead of God's will, we're going to experience sickness and weakness that the prayer of faith will not heal. I can tell you it's already here. I wonder why that we can't see the miracles in the church like we ought to see. We pray, but very little happens. I'll tell you it's because when he gives us health, we waste it in everything but prayer and waiting upon God Almighty. We wasted what he gave us, and we're experiencing sickness in the church. What a disgrace. Amen. Most of the church members call you after the gift. They come on a Sunday night and say, I want you to pray. God, don't heal me by Friday. I'm going to the doctor. I said, you ought to go Monday. Why are you up here? Why don't you go on Monday? You've already made plans for him not to heal you, for heaven's sake. But I can understand why. We have misused the health and the strength that God has has given us to the degree that the prayer of faith doesn't work for many anymore. Amen. Third, since we've used our leisure time for our own pleasure rather than praying for the lost, God will make our leisure time a burden and soon it'll be took away from us. The most common statement heard, especially among preachers, I don't have time. You talk about a prayer meeting. I don't have time. You hear that all the time with people. Amen. We have everything preserved time, but we have no time. My mother did a washing for seven kids and her husband in an old wash pot, poking it with a stick, rubbing it out on a rub board, and had more time to deal with our children than a mother, modern mom has with dishwashers, 
clothes washers, clothes dryers, hair dryers, and everything else. We have misused that leisure time, and God is making it a burden to us. Are you hearing me? We never use it to pray and wait upon God, and God is taking it away from us. No matter how much time we seem to serve, we don't ever seem to get it all done. I said, we don't ever seem to get it all done. Amen. But the most frightening effect of God's displeasure with the church who refuses to obey His command in discipling the nations has to do with our most precious commodity to that church wherever she is, God says, since you do not teach your young people to give their lives to reach the world, then that world is going to take them away from you. You won't teach them to reach a well. Now the world is reaching them. More practices in the church than in the world. Drug everywhere. In the church. Simply because we just built a gymnasium from the play in. Instead of stuffing tracks in their pocket, putting them on a street corner to face the devil where iron could come into that soul. You don't, you don't make soldiers at ice cream parties. If there had been ice cream and cake in abundance, that prodigal never would have left that hog pen, mister. No, no. It, it, is, it is only in the tests, the trials. But we refuse to give those young people to reach a world. Now world has come to take them from us. Without this commitment, young people become useless to God and a grief to parents and the church. You hear me? They become a grief to parents and the church. There's a story in your Bible about a woman. She had some boys. She owed a debt. And the creditors came and said to her, if you don't pay the debt, we're going to take your boys. She went to the man of God. Now you have the told story. That man of God, that is God, the tip typology. Amen. That woman is the church. Amen. She owes a debt. And, and she goes to God. He says, he says to her, what do you have? She says, a little bit of oil. Then pull that church back in there. Fill it up. Quit playing games. Quit fornicating with the Hagars. Bring them back into that altar. Pour them full. Pay your debt. I can tell you, that world is knocking on our door. They're saying, you owe us a gospel of deliverance. You owe us a gospel of healing. And if you don't pay your debts, we are going to take your kids. They've took them. I'm telling you, they've took them. You know, God made it exciting to be young. God made it. When the church, when that young person could sit home and watch a TV and tell when that canary's going to sing and when that deacon's going to pray and that preacher's going to offer his little sermonette, why are they going to go? They ain't. But I can tell you, you make Jesus alive in this place and the front row will be filled with the young. I said he'd be filled with the young. But because we never taught them to reach a world, to give your life for this and this alone, amen, the world has come to take them away from. Paul said in Romans 1, we're debtors, amen, for this gospel to a world. Amen. Many will say this is a severe judgment. If you listen to me, if you had a son whose brother was drowning and the son had the means to save his brother but simply preferred to enjoy himself on the shore, wouldn't you deal pretty sh sharply with that boy? Wouldn't that make that boy a murderer if he had the means to get that brother out of the water but yet he preferred to stay on the bank and enjoy himself instead of committing himself? to the water, maybe risking his own life to save that brother, we'd deal pretty harshly with him. We would say, he is a murderer. Amen. Can't 
we understand millions of lost brothers are drowning. Paul said to Corinth, don't be afraid. Paul sending him to Corinth. He said, don't be afraid. Now, God doesn't use words indiscriminately. If there wasn't something to be afraid of, he never would have told him. But he said, I have much people, much people. They've never heard, but they will believe if they hear. Uh, that's, that's God. How many perish tonight? Millions. Each perishing soul is as precious to God as you are, and you and I are God's only means of reaching them. He committed that trust to you and I. What are we going to do about it? To the degree we've refused to obey God's command to reach them, we are guilty of murder. You listening, we're guilty of murder. We can carry on the mechanics, but such guilt on the part of the church will cause God to hide His eyes when we lift our hands, for they're covered with blood of the perishing millions. He'll not look at that. No, sir. He who says he knows God and keeps not His commandment is a liar, according to the Holy Ghost in writing this book. He that claims to know Him and doesn't obey what He said is a liar, and the truth is not in that human being. Repentance brings pardon. There's hope if we'll wake up to this time. Amen. Repentance will bring the forgiveness of God and set us again on the highway of God's greatness. We must turn from stealing the resources which may be used for harvesting of the unreached. Turn from the murder of lost brothers which results from our shameful indulgences. Amen. The lifestyle most of us live would embarrass angels. Amen. When you look at, at the church today, amen, how it lives while millions perish without the gospel. We must turn from the waste of precious time spent in wanton pleasure to prevailing prayer. When the church travails, God said they'll be born. Isaiah said the devil wouldn't open that prison door, but a man on his knees can open that door. The gates of hell will not prevail against a church that knows how to pray. Amen. We can open it. We must turn. We must begin in the primary ages to teach our children to give themselves for the salvation of the lost. Amen. I believe God is saying, I love my church. I love my bride. I love my beloved. I want to cleanse and empower you by the Spirit to take this message to every tribe and every tongue, to take it wherever men are. God's heart aches to pour His healing, His blessing, His salvation through the bride. If you love me, keep my commandments. So easy to sing about it. But the love is demonstrated. You know, I, I, I knew I was a watchman. I watched that church. Oh, I'd see them young people, the wrong kind of uh, testimonies coming. They, the, I see a dress coming in there that I don't believe God's pleased of. Amen. You, you say you, you, you're a clothesline preacher. Well, I've hung out a few washings. I've seen things come in. That church didn't belong there. I can tell you that. And I dealt with it. Didn't care what anybody thought about it. But I dealt with it. I saw things coming in. And I, one Sunday morning, I mean, I was like shooting rabbits. I shouted every Everything jumped up, and a lot of things jumped up. And in that altar, they broke in 2 o'clock before we got out. I mean repentance. People put a lot of money on the altar they'd stole from God. A lot of things. Young people come and tell me they were sorry of how what they'd done and how they'd become careless. Now, going home, I was weeping, driving on the way home. And I said to God, I hate to have to preach like I preached this morning. Amen. I just hate to have to say what I had to say. And he said to me, son,
There's nothing easy about this gospel but loving me. That's all. That's the only thing. I said, I don't know who's understand what you're saying. He said, you've been preaching. You've been living a long time. It's still hard for you to love your enemy. Hard for you to kneel down and pray for those that despitefully use you. It's very difficult for you to lend a man a little money and not expect him to pay it back. It isn't easy. Nothing easy about this gospel. But he that knows God loves God. Amen. That's the only simple thing about this. He that knoweth God loveth God. Hallelujah. God is calling, listen, upon those who truly love Him to be relentless in their pursuit of the lost. We must diligently find out who they are, where they are, and seek to find them and reach them with this gospel. In my heart, I believe God gives certain specifics that He wants you and I to hear tonight. Number one, spend hours daily in earnest, militant, fervent prayer for all people. Find a place to pray. Let the Holy Spirit make intercession through you for them. That's the first thing that God is saying to His church. But number two, live a simple lifestyle. Give regularly and sacrificially to the great cause for which Christ died. You can't take that junk. You can't wear but one pair of shoes. Oh my God. You know I preached in the tri-county of Tennessee. We was on television across the nation in the 60s. We was pretty well all over. I'd been up there for a rally and that night in that auditorium, 90 people came down to be filled with the Holy Ghost and about 40 of them were filled. Every time one of them went through, I went through again. I'm telling you, I got to that hotel. I had too much religion to sleep. Amen. Too full of God. Never slept a wink all night. Try to lay down, but too much. Next morning, I had to catch that Delta freighter home on a Saturday morning. I had to leave out at 6, so I'm up at 4. Hadn't slept. Very tired. I got on that old 727. Wasn't maybe 10 or 12 people on it. And when he lifted up, I heard them wheels come up. I lay that seat back. And the minute it got back, I heard a voice in me said, Who is your God? Why, well, it sounded real. I sat back up. I thought somebody looked over the man over there. He's going to sleep. Man behind me reading the paper. I thought, well, I pushed myself too far. My nerves are breaking up. I lay back again, and the voice said again, Who is your God? I answered that time. I said, the Lord is my God. And the voice said, how do you know? All this inside, how do you know? I said, how can I know? He said, a man will always sacrifice to and for his God. They say they don't know what to put on. That just simply means there's too much in there. They can't figure out which one. And yet they go to the mall. They see a pair of shoes there, $65. They don't have the money. They'll give $10. Do you hold that pair of shoes for me? They'll sacrifice for that self. Self is their God. Amen. They say they don't believe in pledging to missions, but they pledge to General Motors. They pledge to the finance. They'll pledge to anybody who'll give them credit. Amen. Whatever self wants, self gets. Amen. That's what he said to me. He said, when you get home, I want you. I always go early. He knows that. I always went early, unlocked the church, turned the alarm off, got the air condition going, then went to prayer. He said, this morning, get it going, but I want you to walk around. I always parked at the back door, and you could see everybody coming on that parking lot. And he said, I want you now, when you get it all, you just get out there and pray on the parking lot and watch them as they come in. Well, I'm out there, felt kind of foolish, but anyway, I'm there. First man made that turn in a big Lincoln automobile. Now, God don't care if you have a Lincoln, if you give him the equivalent of that Lincoln. If you work, amen, and you pay your bills, God, God, God doesn't want you to take a vow of poverty. He just wants you to let it go through you to give. But as that man made that turn in that big Lincoln, he said he pays 25 cents of every dollar he owns to make 
a payment on that Lincoln. He said he's got that dollar ninety-eight cent body wrapped up in a seven hundred dollar suit that he's paying on. He's wearing a three thousand dollar diamond ring that he's paying on. Now when he comes by you, I want you to say to him for me, I want you to give ten percent of your income to missions. I said he won't do that. I know I am not his God. I'm not his God. You see, we have sacrificed our God. There's plenty of sacrifice made in this room. Oh, yes, sir. We'll do without a lot of things. Smell that new car. We'll do a lot of things. Keep that television going. Amen. But the sacrifice is for our God. S-E-L-F. Amen. Except the, the third thing. Uh, we live a simple lifestyle. We pray diligently. Accept the responsibility to reach all people with the gospel. There's no greater urgency. And finally, all we do should focus on this, whether it's worship, prayer, giving, preaching, or teaching for both young and old, should focus on reaching those children right there with this gospel of Jesus. Those individuals in churches which make their priority God's command to disciple all nations, listen, they, those who do it will receive God's blessing on their lives, on their families, amen, their finances, their health, and all that pertains to them, but not without intense spiritual warfare. If you enter into this, there's going to be a war come to your house because Satan is dead set. This is not going to happen. But I can tell you, you'll have the blessing. You must learn to fight. But in obedience, they will have more and more of God's presence, joy, wisdom, and direction if we'll just move into that. But listen, those individuals in churches which disregard God's command to make disciples of all nations will, will, will suffer difficulties and frustration, curses on their lives, on their families, their finances, their health, and all that pertains to them. They'll have less and less of God's presence and joy, and soon it'll be only empty religious activity. The, the mechanical form of religion that affects nobody. I said it affects nobody. Just come and go like robots. Amen. Lift your hands. We'll do that. I, I had a canary in my house once when my, my wife's mother, she lived with us. That, that canary could say anything. Amen. Say anything. I'd get up in the morning and, and, and uh, 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 go into the prayer meeting. I'd come by and he'd say, what's up, doc? Amen. You know what? We taught him to say, praise the Lord. He had no idea on earth what he's saying. Ninety percent of the church don't know what they're saying. They just lift it up and say, praise the Lord. They don't know what they're saying. You teach an ape to do it, except he can't talk. But you can teach him to raise his hands. That isn't what God's after. He's after a heart. Jesus is anxious to be united with his bride. Oh, I believe that. I believe the time is coming on us when we're going to cry, even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Uh, we, we as a church, we must demonstrate that we're anxious to be with Him. I don't believe what we do. I believe there's a day and an hour. The wedding date's already been set. He isn't waiting around to see what I'm going to do. I said, describe that. No, in an hour when you think not. But I do believe if I'm as anxious to see Him as He is to meet me, I will be about His business. I will be reaching out that she can be a part of that bridal company like me. Amen. We, in our convention at home four or five years ago, I believe it was, you know, I, I didn't let the people coming in know what was happening, but we never rarely take communion in that, but that, that convention, we took communion. Amen. After I preached, I said, we're going to take communion. We, we had young people 
uh, that dressed up like the Arab, like the Hindu, uh, come from Africa, come from everywhere, back there, hid. Nobody knew who they were. And I said, now, when the ushers, I said, when I ask you first time, has everybody been served? I'm asking to see for hands to be raised if they haven't. But when I asked the second time, when I asked the second time, when I did, a young black boy, fine young man, come out there screaming, I have not been served. Amen. They thought some madman had come in. And he climbed up those steps, pointed that finger. I have not been served. And he told where he was from. And when he got through, a young lady screamed in the back. And she comes down there dressed in a Hindu dress. I have not been served. Oh, my God. Listen, if that cry could be heard in this house this morning. The cry, you've been served, but I have not been served. God's Word command us to look forward, hasten the day. Amen. We must be about completing that assignment. God has given the church a hundred times the resources to finish the task. But this requires an earnest desire on the part of that church. And if it's that on the part of the church, it must be the individual. The church is made up of individuals. It must come to that heart. Amen. The adversary, the devil, knows his time is short, so he'll fight against this with all the hatred and resources of hell. He's going to come. He's going to get some folks. I don't think we ought to waste that money over there. There's always going to be that one. Amen. But you, you know, you got to deal with that. Amen. Let that slide. I didn't answer to nothing but the answer to a selfish, covetous heart. The Bible said don't eat with the covetous. That's a lost word in the church today. Amen. We'd be disfellowshipping a lot of people if we did. They're going to be hell. He's going to find church members that don't like the reaching of the law. They think we ought to spend the money to make the pew a little softer for them. But I'm telling you, they perish without God. And the church individually and collectively must know it. The only thing that can stop us is our unwillingness brought on by the love of ease in this country. God said, woe unto them that are at ease inside. The fact that we can sleep at night while millions perish is a tragedy of our time. I spent five weeks in Eastern Europe, I, I mean East Africa, Tanzania. The first time, I'd been to Mexico, but the first time, 1967, I spent five weeks with Morris Plotz, some most warm and friendly people I ever met. They had nothing. They were so poor, I become ill. I actually become ill. I knew for the first time in my life when God said, hardly can a rich man enter the kingdom. He wasn't talking about Rockefeller, talking about me and Brother White here. Amen. We're rich beyond words. I have more luxuries than ancient kings. You hear me? I said, I have more luxuries than ancient kings. He's not talking about Bill Gates. Yeah, Gates, yeah. He's talking about you and me in this room. Hardly can a rich man. And on that one day, I said, said to Plotz, I, I must pray. I, I was so sick. I saw women walk miles to get muddy water out of the only water hole. They had very little to eat. We preached under, under trees for, with, with 50, 60 people, the equivalent in that bush country of 10,000 people, amen, over here in Tampa, amen, hungry people. I went out and began to pray. Oh, I begged God. I pled for them. They had so little and I had so much. And in that time, God spoke to my heart. I knew why I was born in that moment. He said to me, there's nothing you can do, son, about their poverty. There are 20 million of them. But I wanted you to see it. And I said to him, why would you want me to see what I can't do anything about? He said, because the poverty you see in these people physically is the poverty I see in my church spiritually and I called you to do something about that let us stand let us lift our hands to God listen as we hear amen tonight brother brother 
Turner's going to come. We're going to give an altar call for a world that's lost. We've had an altar call day and night, day and night. That little Muslim girl, look at those eyes. That's a real girl. Nobody painted that. That picture was took of her somewhere. Oh, if she heard about Jesus, she'd believe. You know that. That baby would believe if she heard. That pretty little African girl there. If somebody told her, she would believe. Listen, she'd believe. But how can they preach here without a preacher? And how can he preach except to be sent? It's impossible, folks. If we don't care, nobody cares. Let's just lift our hands. Oh, God. I commit myself to this harvest. Oh, God, I commit myself to this harvest. Would you please, great God, would you please hear? I present my body, Lord, as that living sacrifice, holy and acceptable. I want to stand in that gap. I want to make up that hedge. You look for intercessors. I give myself to be that intercessor. Oh, God, if you give it to me, I will give it to you. I promise you, Lord. I will let it go through me if you get it to me. I want them to hear. I don't want to face them in that eternity when I have squandered money that could have reached them. Great God, will you help?